now. I'm going to go ahead and share screen. Mm. Huh. Should have been sharing the PowerPoint screen. Okay. Okay. Can you all um, either say or chat to me? Can you see the PowerPoint? Yes, I can see the PowerPoint. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. If I cut out, also one more thing. Uh, if I cut out, please let me know and I'll just repeat what I said. Okay. So this is the exam one study session for CIT 247. So uh, go ahead and begin. So exam one, this first exam, CIT 247, will only have 30 questions. There will be one matching question with um, general networking vocabulary, but uh, fortunately for you, there will be no short answer questions. So um, yeah, that it sh you should have plenty of time to take the exam. Um, one thing though about the exam, one catch is that you can only see one question at a time. And when that once you leave that question, you can't come back to it. So take as much time as you need for a question and then be sure to move on. And um, you should have plenty of time to finish the exam while getting your, questions, your answers in. But just keep that in mind. You, can only, you can't go back to a question once, or, once you answer it. So in addition to a matching question, there are a few fill-in. However, um, you don't need to know. So basically you're not being asked to just memorize facts and put them down to the fill-in answer. These fill-in questions are basically, you're gonna be given like a terminal with a bunch of commands in it. And you're gonna be asked questions based on um, what is given in the picture. Like for example, it's gonna ask you um, like what password is gonna be used based on these commands. So nothing bad with these fill-in questions. Um, Everything else that does ask you questions is just going to be multiple choice. So the vast majority of the questions are multiple choice. There's one matching question. And however, one thing to keep in mind is that most, if not all, exam questions will differ from quiz questions. Now, I will note that Dr. Assad made these quizzes. Unfortunately, I have not had the time to look at all of them. But I will say I would believe most, if not all, exam questions are going to be different from what you've had in the quizzes. But the general concepts will still be covered. So they won't be terribly different if I'm correct. But anyway, regardless, to prepare for the exam, I would highly recommend you use this study guide to review the topics you'll be tested on. If you want deeper information on them, the past PowerPoints will do the same thing. But concerning the topic in the exam, um, there is a decent number. There's 30 questions worth, but I wouldn't panic over this. This does look like a lot, but it's not too bad. Um, there's only 17 slides here. Well, 14, not including these first three. If you just study these 14 slides after this one, you should be fine, in my opinion. Actually, I think you do quite well. But anyway, um, the basic networking vocabulary will be covered. So you have a, a matching question where you need to man match some um, questions to a definition. Um, these are all terms, the vast majority, if not all of these terms you've already covered, either in this class or previous ones. It won't be anything too hard. Then there will be the switch processes of MAC address learning and frame forwarding. We'll discuss that in a little bit. But there's also, you'll also be tested on your knowledge of collision domains and broadcast domains. You'll basically need to identify them based on a given topology diagram. There will also be networking devices. You'll need to know features that um, certain devices have, or specifically it'll be switches, routers, and hubs, maybe bridges. Then there's VLANs and trunking. You just need to know about the 802.1Q trunking, native VLANs and administrative mode, in addition to how VLANs correlate to broadcast domains and subnets. Um, there will also be troubleshooting. Um, you'll need to know how to troubleshoot air disable interfaces and shutdown interfaces. Oh, I think I cut out. So, You'll need to know how to troubleshoot air disabled interfaces and shutdown interfaces. And then finally, you'll need to know line protocol statuses and port security modes. Okay, first topic is basic networking vocabulary. Two slides of this, but these are the terms you'll need to know in the matching question. So you'll need to know what a rollover cable is. It physically connects a PC to a switch via the console port. So associate the term rollover with console. And um, you should be just fine. Actually, what we could do here, to make this more visible. So um, this is a good time to say this. So in my PowerPoint, I sometimes use this red font here. This is a good one to know. Um, also, I use this like golden font sometimes to do the same thing, but it's mostly just identify um, like the terms you need to, the terms you need to define. But anyway, um, a crossover cable connects two switches together and a straight through cable can connect the router to a switch. So switch memory types, you'll need to list some of these as well. So the first there's RAM, which is the working storage of the switch. It includes the running configuration file, that's key. The ROM stores the boot program that finds the Cisco IOS image and loads it into RAM. 
Then there's flash memory, which stores the iOS image. Associate flash with iOS image for the exam. And then finally, NVRAM startup configuration file and NVRAM should be associated in your mind. And then there's switch features you'll need to define. First, there's virtual LAN, which is a VLAN. It groups devices into the same broadcast domain. So spanning tree protocol disables port switch ports to prevent loops. And auto neg negotiation helps switches agree on optimal speed and duplex setting. Um, did someone try to say something? Okay, I guess not, sorry. Okay, switch modes. So there are three major modes a switch has when you are in the terminal. You should be familiar with these by now, but user mode has limited privileges. They can only read some information. GNS actually, well, it's not supposed to um, put you in user mode, but for some reason this semester it has for some users. Um, you can identify user mode with like the greater than sign. I think it's either greater or less than. But enable global configuration mode after your switch's name, it'll have like the hashtag symbol. But what you need to know for exams is that user mode can only read. It can't configure anything. Enable mode can read all information and can perform some commands. A uh, fun fact is actually at work, I was doing this. Um, you can actually wipe a switch, like delete all its data in enable mode. You don't need global configuration mode. I was actually doing that at work this week. Then finally, I have global configuration mode or just configuration mode. Um, this is where you've been performing all your configurations, like adding IP addresses to switch ports um, or enabling and disabling ports, creating VLANs. Global configuration mode is where you do all that. OK, this is very important here. Now, these next two slides here cover the two processes you'll need to understand for certain questions. You'll need to combine this knowledge together. You won't be quizzed on listing these things here in these two, these two lists, but you need to know this process pretty well in order to answer some of the questions in the exam. So first, we'll discuss how switches forward frames. So this process starts when a switch receives a frame on one of its ports. Now, for example, um, a PC, like a computer, like PCA, for example, sends a frame to a switch. So the switch extracts the frame's destination MAC address from its Ethernet header. It looks up that destination MAC address in its MAC address table. If the address is in the table, the switch forwards the frame to the port specified in its table, unless that port is the same port on which the frame was received. So in other words, basically when a switch receives a frame, it looks to see the destination that the PC is trying to ping with that frame. If the switch knows that destination, that, that, that MAC address, then it will send that, that, that frame to that specific device. However, here, if no entry in the exists in the table for the MAC address, the switch forwards the frame out of all interfaces except for the port it originates from. In other words, it broadcasts the frame. So that's going to be very important. Oh, I think I cut out. But that's a very important point here. So if the switch does not know does not have any entries in the MAC address table or does not have an entry for a specific MAC address, then it's going to forward that frame out of all the interfaces. It's going to broadcast it all. That would happen, for example, when a switch is just booted, for example, or, or excuse me, or is just booted or is just started, like it's just been installed. A switch MAC address learning now. So the following describes how switches learn MAC addresses. So the first step is a switch receives a frame in one of its ports. The switch retrieves the source MAC address from the frame's Ethernet header. So this is an important difference here. When switches forward frames, they're looking at the destination MAC addresses. When switches are, are trying to learn a MAC address from a frame, they are looking at the source MAC address. One thing to keep in mind is that these two processes typically happen together. So a switch receives a frame. In addition to looking at the source MAC address, it's also looking at the destination MAC address as well. So the, both of these processes are happening together. But anyway, the switch receives the source MAC address from the frame's Ethernet header. The switch searches the MAC address in its table. If the MAC address is not found, the switch then adds that MAC address to its table, associating the address with the port it was, it was received from. So basically, the MAC address table has a list of ports and the list and, and associates them with switch port, or excuse me, it lists MAC addresses it's learned and associates them with ports or interfaces on that switch. So the exam is going to have questions on learning and forwarding frames, <clears throat> excuse me, or learning and forwarding. So the exam, I'm oh, sorry, I cut out. So these questions will, these questions are going to involve this um, topology here. And you will be asked which ports the frames were forwarded out of. And also there will be a question on which you'll need to discuss which um, frames a switch learns, like which PCs it learns it from. So, um, this will require you to know how switches learn MAC addresses and forward frames. So 
in other words, when a, a PC is trying to ping, let's say, for example, PC2 or PCB is trying to ping PCC, if this MAC address does not, or this switch does not know host C's MAC address, when it receives host B's frame, it's going to learn host B's MAC address, but it's going to forward out that, for that frame out of all the other interfaces. So that's kind of the general process that's going to happen. But after that broadcast frame happens, basically all these PCs send responses to the switch and then switch all their MAC addresses. So after that, um, a PC, whenever a PC pings another one, it's going, the switch is going to know which um, interface to send that, that um, frame from or through. I do want to ask right now, you can just chat or talk, but does any of this, what I've said so far about this um, slide make any sense? Do you understand what I'm saying? Excellent. That's good. Thank you. So um, I am heavily stressing this point because there's multiple questions on the exam about it. It makes up a pretty heavy portion of the exam. I would say probably a sixth or fifth of it. So this is extremely important to know. So um, some tips I give you here is that remember that when a device sends a frame, the switch learns that, MAC that, that device's MAC address. This is assuming we're starting at the very beginning, like when this process begins. So if it knows the MAC address of a destination device, it will send the frame to that device only. So for example, after the broadcast frame is sent out and the switch learns all the MAC addresses, any other pings are going to end up with the switch forwarding that frame to the specific device. However, if the broadcast has not happened yet, it's going to happen. It's going to forward that frame out of all the other uh, interfaces except the one that it received the frame from. It's not going to um, broadcast from there or broadcast to that device. Here are a couple of other hints. When a PC sends a broadcast frame, note that it will cause the switch to learn all the, Mac, the device's MAC addresses. This is because when the, PC, the switch sends it, it first learns this device's MAC address. Then it forwards it at all the ports. Um, these PCs respond, and then the switch looks at the, so the source MAC addresses from these frames, and then adds them to the, its MAC address table. So also, when a PC sends a frame, the, de the destination PC sends a response frame. That's basically what I was just talking about. So this is something to keep in mind when you're taking the exam. These are going to be very important part. That's going to be a very heavy part of the exam. So we're going to also compare broadcast domains and collision domains. So a collision domain is the set of devices whose frames can collide with one another. Now, this is very important here. You need to know what devices break up collision domains. So bridges, switches, and routers all separate networks into multiple collision domains. However, hubs do not. So hubs cannot separate a network into multiple collision domains. That's going to be important. That's going to be questioned uh, in the exam, by the way. Remember, hubs do not separate collision domains. If you can see this diagram here, the little device here with this an arrow going back and forth, that is a hub. Notice how the circle goes all around it. That means this is one collision domain. This is also a bridge here. Notice how this circle here is also a collision domain. Bra bridges do separate devices into different collision domains, but it only separates them into two. Note how switches, however, and routers, every interface on a switch and a router is its own collision domain. That's going to be important because there's going to be a question that's going to ask you to count the number of collision domains in a topology. It's not going to be this one, by the way. So be sure to use this as an example and learn which devices these are. So that's a switch here. This is a router. This is a hub. And this is a bridge. Be sure to memorize um, how or which ones create multiple collision domains, but also memorize which ones create multiple broadcast domains. And that's only routers. So only routers create broadcast domains. Each frame on a router is its own broadcast domain. Switches, bridges, and um, if switches, bridges, and hubs do not create broadcast domains. And I'll define broadcast domain here. It is the set of devices for which when one device sends a broadcast, all devices receive it. So th this is going to be another very important part of the exam as well. We're going to quickly discuss some networking devices. Now, you don't need to know a ton, but pretty much everything on this table is going to be very important for the exam. I would say especially like the multiple collision domains, multiple broadcast domains, the cable distances, the bandwidth. Um, the, these tape, these uh, four right here especially are going to be very important. So this table does summarize the major differences between networking devices. Be sure to memorize these facts for the exam. There will be multiple questions that I'll ask about them. You'll need to know which device um, has these features. So for example, you might be asked what devices create multiple broadcast domains. So that's only routers. 
which devices have greater cabling distances. That's going to be all, all of these devices. Increased bandwidth is only bridge, switch, and router. OK, switch CLI commands. So the exam will have multiple questions that will have a terminal session, session similar, but not exactly like the one, right? So you're not going to see this exact these exact commands. They're going to be different ones. They're going to have different words and stuff. But the general, oh, I'm sorry. So um, this terminal here is an example. You're not going to see this exact terminal in the exam. You're going to see like similar commands like be goal configuration mode. You can see the enable secret, enable password commands, and so forth. But basically, you'll need to know what these commands do. So um, for example, you need to know which commands affect the login password. So for example, I'll tell you right here. Um, in this case, if everything was saved here, the login console or login password for console connecting console would be spam. That's because console right here. Um, this should be changed. Yeah, that's better. OK. So um, for line console, so for the, sorry, for the login, but for telnet, it would be toast. So look here, the keyword here is line console versus line VTY. VTY would refer to telnet. So you also need to know enable passwords. So when you have two enable commands, so enable secret and enable password, the enable secret one actually will override the um, enable password. Um, can anyone chat or talk? Um, explain to me why this is. Why would enable secret override enable password? Okay, I'll go ahead and explain why. So the reason enable secret overrides enable password here is that the enable secret command creates an encrypted password. So enable secret is the command you want to use. Uh, when you use enable password and then use enable secret, enable secret is going to override enable password. And I will say that is true even if the enable secret command is done first. So just remember the enable secret, uh, the enable password be the one that's next to the enable secret command when you see these two commands in the same session. So the switch display message, you're going to see MOD or TD and then two exclamation marks or something similar. And then you'll see a message. I would say type in the message or the tip, type in the message, not the exclamation marks. Um, I should, well, yeah, I would say do that. Type just this. If you type in the exclamation marks, um, that'll probably count the question wrong, but you can always ask Dr. Assad or me to change that. Finally, tell that connection. Now, this is pretty important here. So these line VTY commands, they have two numbers here. So basically that has the number of connections the switch can have all at once. So um, you start counting from zero and you go all the way up to this number. So this is actually 16 telnet connections. Now, obviously, as we learned from the lab, and I apologize for that, is that GNS switches don't actually support 15. They only support like, I guess, five. Yeah, I apologize for that. I still need to update the command guide for that. I'll try to remember to do that. But anyway, um, that's just to let you know for the exam. Okay, so the lab two assignment and command guide can help you review what these commands do. On um, the command guide, this is another thing I made a command guide for studying these commands. It'll let you know what they do. <clears throat> but I will give you one hint for the exam. What would happen? I want you all to um, either chat me or tell me this. What would happen if the switch was rebooted after the session? So look carefully at the commands. Let's say all these commands or was everything that was typed on the switch, we reboot it. What would happen to the configurations we just made? Okay, I guess I'll go ahead and answer. I should check. Do you, anyone hear me? You can just chat me a quick message. Can anyone still hear me? But anyway, what would happen here? Okay, good. Thank you. So basically what would happen is that all these configurations would not be saved. That's because there's no copy run start. If the Swiss was just rebooted, you, do, you, you would lose all these. You've probably experienced this, all, experienced this already in GNS, but if you don't run copy run config or copy RUST or copy running config, startup config, you'll lose everything here. Okay, so switch show commands. There will be some questions on sh that will involve um, knowledge on show commands. Um, for example, there's the show interface command. It'll just list interface or information about the interfaces. Now this includes status codes. That's gonna be important. So show interface switch port displays important facts about the switch ports as its name implies. This includes its name, whether a port is a trunk, its status and so forth. 
show interface trunk will show which interfaces are trunking interfaces. So there's a key similarity between these two you want to keep in mind for the exam. Then there's show CDP neighbors. This shows neighboring devices and information about them. So um, that'll be another thing to keep in mind for the exam. So you don't need to know all the show commands, but just a few. Um, the ones I listed here that will be enough for you. So VLANs and trunking. So the VLAN information you need to know isn't incredibly in depth. Like you're not going to be asked to configure anything in the exam, but you'll need to know some basic facts about them. So um, there's VLANs, which is a switch setting that virtually groups one or more ports into the same broadcast domain. And actually, there's domains. VLANs and broadcast domains are synonymous, basically. A, broadcast, a VLAN is a broadcast domain. And that's why we, 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 both are, we basically have to divide the switch ports into multiple broadcast domains. Without VLANs, one switch is just a single broadcast domain. But with VLANs, we create virtual divisions that create multiple broadcast domains on the same switch. So VLANs follow many of the same rules that apply to LANs. For example, all devices and interfaces in a VLAN are in the same broadcast domain. Here's an important part. Each VLAN needs to have its own subnet. So if you have like three VLANs, you need three subnets on that switch. So without routing, devices in different VLANs cannot communicate with one another. Well, I should say not in the same switch. I should say the devices connected to that switch in those VLANs. If you have three VLANs, you need three subnets for the devices all within those VLANs based on which VLAN they're in. But then we have trunking. Trunking allows communication between devices in the same VLAN that are connected to different switches. So trunking uses 802.1Q um, encapsulation. It is an IE standard protocol that inserts a 32-bit tag into the Ethernet header. Uh, an important thing here is native VLANs. Um, frames of this VLAN are not tagged. So when you have 802.1Q trunking and a switch sends a frame, or a switch sends a frame to another switch, and it, that frame is from the native VLAN, the frames from that VLAN are not tagged. So um, the native VLAN is VLAN 1 by default, but that's an important point here. These are not tagged. OK, good thing. So trunking administrative, administrative modes. So the following table showcases the results of various trunking administration mode options configured on two connecting trunking interfaces. Forgive, for the word, forgive me for the word salad there, but um, basically what that means is that one interface is configured with one mode, another interface is connected with another. Oh, good question. Uh, to my knowledge, no. I don't believe you can have more than one native VLAN. Um, native VLAN is, um, I believe the reason for that is to support switches that can't support VLANs basically. Um, but yeah, if you put a device in a native VLAN or two devices in native VLANs between two switches, they won't be tagged. The native VLAN is more of a compatibility option. Actually your textbook talks a little more about native VLANs, but to answer your question, there can I believe there can only be one. But that is a really good question. I'm really glad you asked. Excellent. OK. Now, this table here is um, may look a little daunting. But if you just memorized um, how the access or the administrative modes interact with one another, it becomes a lot simpler. So first, there's access mode, which makes a port always act like an access non-trunking port. So these kind of ports would be like the, port, the switch ports that are connected to your PCs. Obviously, there's no reason a piece of port connected to a PC needs to do trunking. Trunking is only to keep um, is only for ports between switches, and that's if there are multiple VLANs. But anyway, yeah, access ports are going to be non-trunking. No trunking is going to happen whatsoever. If one interface has access mode enabled, then the other interface's operational mode is not going to be trunking. Even if it's set to trunk, it doesn't matter what the other switch is set to. So you can see here, if both switches are set to access and access, the operational will be access. Um, access and dynamic auto will also result in access, and as will access and dynamic desirable. So no matter what, if this is access, there's not going to be a trunk and access should not be, you're not going to be quizzed on this. Um, but yeah, these are not used. You don't need to worry about this for the, the, the trunk and access being together. That's not going to be quizzed on. Um, however, if you... You can also set the port always act like a trunking port. I should that say that's concerning administration mode. What is administration mode is what the switch port is set to, but operation mode is what it's actually going to be. You're not going to be quizzed on that def those definitions, but that's just to keep in mind. Now, there's also dynamic desirable and dynamic auto. These are interesting. So dynamic desirable makes a port actively send negotiation messages to decide whether to use trunking, and dynamic auto makes a port passively wait to receive trunking negotiation messages. 
So basically, if two ports, you can see in this table, two ports of six is dynamic auto, because they're not looking to be a trunking interface, but they can, they're just waiting to be, they're just going to be access mode, operational access mode. Um, if, however, an interface is set to trunk, and then we have dynamic auto or dynamic viral, it's automatically going to trunk. It'll actually, the interface will actually become trunking interfaces. Dynamic desirable, when it's paired up with another interface as dynamic auto or dynamic desirable, will also result in trunking interfaces. Uh, I do want to ask um, if you could chat me quickly. Does this make sense? Do I need to explain this further? Okay. What would you like me to explain more? Just um, to get a better idea of what you need to understand. So um, if you're, uh, while you're on uh, dynamic auto, okay, yes. So dynamic auto, so um, to understand dynamic auto, we need to first look at dynamic desirable. So um, when, you, when you set up a switch interface or trunking interfaces, you can either set them to explicitly be trunking, like they're gonna be trunking no matter what, basically, unless you have access. Dynamic desirable, basically the switch, you set the interface to not explicitly, explicitly be a trunk, but it's actively looking to be, it's looking to negotiate with the other interface to be trunking interface. Dynamic auto basically is the trunk can be an interface, a trunk, excuse me, the interface can be a trunking interface, but the other device, the other interface needs to be actively searching or actively um, looking to negotiate that. So for example, we have one switch and we have an interface, like say like E00, then we have another interface on the second switch called E00 or E01. If we set E0 of zero to dynamic auto, and we set the other interface to dynamic auto, the problem is, is that we won't actually receive a trunking interface. This is because these, um, we set the interface to dynamic auto, they don't have the capacity to set up a negotiation, basically. They, they can do it, but they can negotiate, but they can't ask for the negotiation. They can't ask to negotiate, basically. Um, dynamic desirable, however, doesn't make the trunk explicitly, or the interface explicitly trunk, but it does set the interface to look out to basically um, negotiate trunking settings. Does that, you can chat me, um, Kate, but that, does that answer your question a little better? Excellent, okay. So you don't need to overthink it too much here. Um, basically what you're gonna be asked about, you're not gonna be asked about what these settings are gonna be doing, but you're gonna be asking, basically you receive a question like, um, hey, this interface is set to this. Like for example, let's say it's set like the dynamic auto. And you'll be like, hey, what settings will make this trunk um, or this interface become a trunking port? So um, you're going to be given these four options. And if the first port is set to dynamic auto, the only thing that's going to make the other interface trunk form a trunk is going to be setting it to trunk or dynamic desirable. That's kind of what you're going to be asked here. And that's what this table does. So what you just need to memorize how these settings interact with one another. So troubleshooting, um, not a ton on troubleshooting, but there's going to be two problems you're going to need to discuss in the lab, not with short answer, but with multiple choice questions. So if you have a port that's error disabled, to enable it, to re-enable it, you need to disable and then re-enable the port. So it's shutdown, no shutdown. So when you have error disabled, the resolution is shutdown, no shutdown commands. So if you have a shutdown interface, it's going to have the, um, it's going to basically shut down completely. It's administratively shut down. To uh, re-enable it, you just do the no shutdown command. Now, if you want to trouble, if you want to just, um, look at more troubleshooting stuff or have more details on these problems, the module for PowerPoint has more stuff on this. But um, here is another thing: interface status codes. So when you do a command like show interface description, you'll see a bunch of these. Uh, you see see the interface names, but you also see like these these codes: line status and protocol status. So what these do is that they tell you the status of the interface as the impl name implies. I wish I had a better word to say that, but basically they tell you what is going on with the interface. So if you see up, up, that means the interface is working. That's good. You can kind of ignore this part here, interface status. I don't think that you might need to know this, um, to memorize it anyway, but you may not just to let you know. But, um, excuse me. So 
However, if you don't see up, up, you'll see one of these error messages with the exception of up, down. That's more, that's a router thing. You're not going to see that in an exam, I don't believe. But if you do, it just say it's not expected or whatever is like that. But basically when you see admin down and slash or admin down slash down on an interface, that means it's disabled. That means it's a configure with the shutdown command. It's administratively down. It can't forward anything. So when you see down, down, you have the not connect interface status message. This means that the case is a physical cable issue. So the cable is bad or there's the device on the other end is down or there's just no cable at all. You tip, you'll see this quite a bit on like GNS where you see down, down. With the, if the interfaces aren't already shut down with the shutdown command, you'll see down, down on the interfaces. Um, second is up, down or third is up, down. That's not gonna be on switch. Then you have down, down, air disabled. So port security has disabled the interface. Air disabled refers to port security disabling the interface. And then finally up up is just interface working. So memorize this. You will be asked to map these to their um, causes and or their interface status, just to let you know. So this table is gonna be important for you to memorize. Finally, we have port security settings. So um, let's see here. So there's three major uh, port security settings is protect, restrict and shut down. So you'll need to know what each of these do. You'll have a, another matching question that discusses this. So the protect option will only discard offending traffic. That's all protect mode does. Restrict mode will discard traffic. It will also send a log message and increment the violation counter. And then shut down will do all three or I'll do all four uh, of those actions. So basically, they these three settings increment in um, strictness. And that's how you can memorize that. So that is basically it. That is pretty much all you need to know for exam one. Not too many slides. Um, I think you'll do pretty well in this exam. If you study everything we went through today, you should do just fine in the exam. But before I stop my recording um, or stop the session, I just wanted to um, thank you all for coming here. And if you have any questions on anything, that would be a very good time to ask. I don't have any questions, but do you mind showing that one slide if it's not too much of a problem? Um, showing the one slide with the, it had the, um, the topography with the, that you said we'd be tested on. Hmm. Oh yeah. Yeah. I just want to take a look at that. Excellent. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, by the way, this will be posted on Canvas. Okay. Yeah, you'll have all today and whatever time you have till tomorrow to review this off. Are you in the in-person or online? In person. How are you liking it? I like it a lot. I enjoy being in person. Excellent. It's nice to have. Yeah. Really good. So yeah, um, this, I will say this topology will appear. This exact topology will appear in the exam. I wish I could give a question example, but I don't think I can really do that. Honestly, this, this, this slide is, these, um, this, sorry. <laughs> this presentation is pretty telling what all you'll be tested on. So um, yeah, do study it very carefully. Um, the, like, I, like I said before, the exam questions are going to be very different from your quiz questions. Um, I do know that a lot of students in the past have struggled with these exams. Um, so do, do, do try to do your best and um, take your time because you have plenty of time to answer the questions. Um, you should do fine, I believe, if you just study this PowerPoint. You might want to go a little more in depth. I would say look at the first four PowerPoints as well, like from the first four modules. Those PowerPoints will also give you more details that might help you. But I think what's here will get you most of the way through. I would say another thing, if you don't understand a certain topic, go back to the PowerPoint and take a look at it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Any other questions or Kate, do you have any questions? Excellent. I did want to ask you too, how did this session, was this session helpful? Did you learn a lot? Absolutely. Excellent. I'm really glad to hear that. I'm glad 
I, I'm glad I was worth your time. I feel a lot more prepared. So thank you, Tyler. Very welcome. I'm glad I was worth your time today. Um, a lot of people haven't been coming to my um, my office hours. And it, it looks to me like you all are doing really well and are pretty independent. So honestly, that makes me very happy. Um, previous semesters, I've had a lot more people come. I guess I should stop the recording now. <laughs> but anyway, thank you all for listening. And um, um, this video will be on YouTube for you all to review. And uh, goodbye.